going to talk to you today about the significance of medical records. I do not have a huge um, research background, but the uh, little amount of research I've done and my uh, educational uh, activities uh, in, in training and assessing has very often been centered around medical records. Uh, and I will take you through uh, historically how it's developed and, and what are the, the lessons for, for the future. So this is an area that I'm very interested in and currently I'm also very involved in the medical legal aspect of, of, um, of medical records and one informs the other. So uh, I titled that lecture from a poor performance indicator to a successful workplace-based assessment. Okay. So, um, I'm sure you all know this, but if you don't, a little bit of history. Uh, the GP medical record, the primary care medical records, in most places, not everywhere, uh, for many, many years was the Lloyd George file. And that is approximately an A5 size. It's not a big file. Um, yeah, That's exactly the thing. Exactly. I can dream of them, I sit in my sleep because we used to carry them around for our surgeries, sometimes not allowed, you take them home to look at reports, but we're not supposed to take them out of the surgery. So they were all handwritten. Uh, we had lined line paper pages, and they came in two different colors, blue and red. How magic the NHS is. Uh, I hope you all recognize that. Male and female. <laughs> and um, the, the average record entry um, was about two lines. I did look to try to find some validated research, not to be uh, evidence-based uh, practice, and I could not find it, but there were a lot of uh, reports and qualitative reports saying that that was really what people used to write. But what was really essential was that uh, the records were small size and, and very mobile. We used to carry them around. There were GPs with two jackets and the record in their pocket. They used to go for visits and so on. So, um, this is the guy, David Lloyd George, and the record's name comes from, from him. And uh, it just, if you see some pictures, then you can, uh, what I was just explaining is pretty obvious. This is the, oops, sorry, this is the, the envelope of the medical record, and they used to be neatly and tightly filed in little boxes that will go around. Do you recognize that? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What a day, what day days were those? Fantastic. So this is the record close up. You can see the different colors there, the blue and the red. This is uh, not my surgery, it's something found on the internet. All stuff there with bits flowing out, overflowing. Um, and this is a, an example of record entries. It's okay if I move sometimes with regards yeah, to this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, this uh, are typed up, but they were handwritten. So um, this was done in 1975. We eat time, depression, volume 10 milligrams, 30, that means they got 30 tablets, certificate one week. Uh, same person coming back a week later, volume 10 milligrams. So these ideas that we have now about explaining your thinking and your differential diagnosis and all that just did not exist. A couple of lines if you're lucky. And if you could read them because they're also scribbled. Uh, again, <laughs> uh, they're vaunted two in night maximum, that's it. Uh, somebody else is a random entry. Pain now appears to be all right. Chest X-ray certificate. You have no idea what what happened to this person. Somebody just died. Uh, dog bite, tetanus. That's all. This one, cold flu, also rheumatism. Certificate one week paracetamol. Mm -hmm. It's exactly as it came. So that's where we were. Um, and there were some places I remember uh, some really clever practices when I was younger that started introducing uh, A4 records. Um, and uh, I think there were other places, I don't know if in Scotland they had A4 records at some point or not, uh, to get more stuff in. And they were very similar, the hospital records were also always A4 size. And then we started having uh, more and more, oops, more and more tools, uh, technological tools of those days, of trying to get uh, some system into the record. So, you had a review prescription cards, the medical summary cards, uh, then you started having printouts of your repeat prescriptions, because re repeat prescriptions went on computer much earlier. And you also started having laboratory printouts. 
of a loose laboratory test that you just uh, joined together with the Treasury Tag. Did you say that, uh, or someone was saying, in your surgery, did you, uh, you get some workflows of results? Yeah, we had flow diagrams, flow diagrams. For chronic disease, and yeah. summary records. Mm. So this is the kind of innovation people want to try, try to do. They had, it's not a good medium to work with, is the old record, but they started doing these things, trying to uh, improve the record and how it was used. And we came through a uh, <coughs> grey area not so long ago where the computer records were coexisting with the paper records. And I remember those days about um, 15, 18 years ago, so not that long, uh, just before the millennium, just after, where you go to the box to do your surgery with your records, but you also have your computer records there. The prescribing by that time was fully on the computer records, you had to look it up. Then you might do dual entries on the computer and the paper, or just on the computer and have the paper records with you to look at letters. And um, what really made a big difference uh, going through this gradual process is the, um, the arrival of large-scale scanning of correspondence. And I know it sounds very, very pretentious in the early 21st century, but that's really what it was. It was after the millennium that they started doing that. And suddenly, there was no longer a reason uh, to take the medical record with you in a consulting room because everything was there. And it was a bit clunky to start with, but it started getting better. But the last few years, things have moved on very quickly, and now you have uh, information actually is continuously directly inserted into medical records. So when you arrive each morning, the medical record overnight has received uh, referral letters, has received discharge summaries, uh, has received uh, a lot of blood results, x-ray results. Um, even uh, the scanning is not the biggest thing anymore. A lot of documents are sent in uh, already converted PDF from the people who send you. They send them to you. But um, people uh, scan a lot of document, uh, documents using this document, which is a document management system. Um, and the other thing that's been happening is analytics and statistics. So anything you do now, any result, you can click on it, you can see whether it's been normal or abnormal, get graphs, you can see the whole thing there. But even most, more important, you start having protocol-driven uh, medical decision support systems, uh, like medical alerts, and the early ones were very simple uh, programming. You have, um, if one condition is met, the alert goes off. So if, if his cholesterol is high, you get an alert, or the blood pressure is high. But now they become a lot more sophisticated with um, some sort of thinking, thinking process about it, some decision making. And even more scary uh, <coughs> is that you now uh, have continuous communication. So you're doing surgery and things pop up all the time, your colleagues communicate with you through the medical record. The important thing is that this random correspondence then becomes part of the medical record. I don't think people realize that. When you send a task about a patient or a message, uh, you can delete it if you want to, but you can find in the audit of the medical records there. And if there was a, a case, it could be found. Uh, mm -hmm. Just going back briefly on these uh, medical decision support systems, again, the big change is that initially it was voluntary and we had control. We chose to uh, introduce new software in our practices that would do that for us. But now, it's becoming such that we don't even have control. So NHS England, through various agencies, updates without us having any say our various systems. So one thing we all going on and on about at the moment is this sepsis uh, obsession that exists in the UK. Everything's to do with sepsis. So um, they overnight introduce also the little alert system. So if you put in that your pulse is above 90, Immediately, big things come, red things, sepsis, sepsis, won't let you move if you do sepsis assessment, even though you know there's nothing to do with sepsis, what you're doing. But uh, they, they're doing these things to us, so that's what's fine. Um, and um, it was important to, um, to go through that from the old paper record to the new electronic record because the technology, as, as I said just now, has become part of the medical record. So 
Uh, an example is, uh, I get examples of messages, but I give you other examples. Uh, if you receive the document electronically, there's an electronic uh, date stamp on it, which is the date stamp that you can't change and alter. It doesn't matter if you manually stamp and scan it, it's what the system has. And um, if there was an inquiry, a coroner's uh, inquest, all sorts of things, and for example, they ask you, when did you receive the certain information about a certain patient before something else happened? All that now has become part of the medical record. They can ask to see the date stamps, they can ask to see um, what alerts was the practitioner was getting at the time when she was seeing a patient. So that is part of the medical record. You can't produce any printouts, but they can come and interrogate your record and see it. So, um, and this is really what I just said in, in a summary. So uh, that's all now part of the uh, examined medical records. So, just go back to history again uh, and look at when people started um, putting markers down that the medical record was very important and was signified more than just a record. It was almost a mirror of the practice of the, of the practitioner. So, uh, 1954 is quite early. Um, Taylor said one has reached the conclusion that the key to good general practice is the keeping of good clinical records. Um, and uh, then he went on to say how a quick glance can help him make a diagnosis. And you know, there's a lot of entries and a lot of work has been done. And then in 1982, um, there was a paper about preserving presentation, medical record mm -hmm. cards, and professional conduct. And uh, there was a conclusion uh, that to for that the professional conduct does rely upon the records in many ways, continuity, um, decision-making, um, justification of, of decisions, and so on. But in order that the professional <coughs> would be able to rely on these records, there was a need for development of a community of practices, so a set of practices which provided for the systemat systematic documentation and comprehension information. And what this says in, very, in a very wordy way is what I just said earlier, that we started having little summary cards and uh, uh, writing the prescription and people put flow charts about things. So it's just people start developing uh, systems, rules, set of rules and practices that um, became sometimes universally accepted and sometimes they didn't, so that they could rely on the medical records for what they were doing. And uh, uh, more recent work said that um, um, that the clinical records is uh, is actually calls it a clinical tool. Uh, I suppose a, one can say almost the same way as your stethoscope and so on. Um, and uh, they give individual considerations and the reasons for decisions. You may already, some of you, be thinking about some of our educational content these days and how we talk about reflections and what people, why they make decisions. Um, and it goes on about um, communication um, and also recognize fully the importance, the medical legal importance of the good records. Um, I thought I get a Greek name or something. <laughs> So that's very recent, and I'm sure this sentence you've heard it before. He he doesn't claim it is an original sentence, but I think if you ever had spoken to a medical legal advisor mm -hmm. from the MBS and ABU, they will always say, if you did not write it down, it did not happen. Um, so in that last paper, there was also some uh, attempt to uh, to do some. Um, uh, classifications of uh, 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 good and poor clinical practice. This is not original work. This was reviewing what was already there. Um, and you can see uh, I have put uh, aside the areas. Um, and it, it's not just general practice. It's to hospital admissions and so on. And you can see uh, the differences uh, of where problems can arise with poor, medical, poor, poor clinical records. And um, some do's and don'ts. And a lot of my partners sometimes would be very happy to make humorous or personal comments in the records by using abbreviation, thinking that the patients will understand it, uh, or ambiguous terms. And sometimes physicians would be very proud of ambiguous terms because they kind of cover themselves. 
You know the famous like you write a letter. The patient insists on. Uh, I cannot find any pathology, but the patient insists on a referral. And we all know what that means. It uh, means he's a pain in the neck, and uh, they want to be referred. <laughs> so um, the principles are really of uh, the records uh, being always objective, uh, making observations. Um, always assume that this record will be seen and read by, sometime by the patients or by a third party, uh, document things like consent. So this is just summarizing things that are uh, already were evident. Uh, the General Medical Council, so 2013, there's been updates on the good medical practice. It hasn't really changed much in this, and I suspect there's a big change in coming around about medical records. Uh, so in paragraphs 19 to 21, talks about uh, the, what, what should be in the medical records. And you can see there's words there like legible. And you can see how uh, these three paragraphs will have been more or less been uh, unchanged over the years, how they've come back through, come through history. Because really, the records are legible now. They're almost entirely electronic. You may have some issues with spelling, but I'll talk about that as well in a second. Because with the templates, the words are pre-decided, so you don't have to even spell them. You know, you start mm -hmm. putting the word and then it gives you the choice and you pick one up, particularly the diagnosis and so on. So that's what the GMC said. And uh, then let's see what the medical uh, organization, medical defense organization said. Um, so they again said, talking about the decisions, the agreed actions, who makes and agrees these decisions, so that's the MPS. Um, and then the NPS, and I, I want you to pay a lot of attention here because we're going to come back to this. The NPS gives some uh, main points about what makes good clinical records. And the information I put there here is divided into two sections. Its content is at section one, and there's enough on content that I've got on two pages. And after that is presentation, which I also have on two pages. So I just quickly want to look at some of those things that they have under contents. Um, and um, examination of the patient, all systems examined. Now, this is very self-explanatory. Of course, the records have to have it there. But I just wonder if some of us already start thinking about WBPA and what competence we're checking. Um, differential diagnosis, um, history. Um, then consent, which is time and time again, uh, medication, um, follow-up, which we call safety net in these days, and when what happens afterwards. Um, and again, they go on about being objective and clear and factual, and uh, that this should be uh, attributable, uh, that this shouldn't be changed. This, these are more about probity, these issues here. And the Medical Defense Unit uh, says more or less uh, the same things, but I've got some extra things here as, as the world changes. Uh, telephone conversation and home visits. Now, home visits have become rare. Mm -hmm. Telephone conversations have become very common. Mm -hmm. And one day the emails as well, because actually not one day, it's already there, uh, reply to patients by email. Um, photographs and x-rays, I was just saying earlier that uh, photographs are more and more part of it. Uh, most uh, nursing teams these days will photograph religiously from day one till resolution uh, a leg ulcer that they dress in so they can compare with the pictures. Uh, we start just uh, start doing another telemedicine project in dermatology with so many of those, not always successful. Um, and there should be uh, obviously all the correspondence records and there should be discussion with clinical colleagues and third parties. So. In fact, there was a GMC case recently that I got involved with that the conversation between a trainer and a trainee had not been recorded in the records because it happened in the corridor and it just not necessarily recorded. But when there was a problem with a clinical decision and the trainee was investigated, then the trainer was investigated because the trainee had said that I took advice and that wasn't anywhere written. And there was a question as to whether that should have been part of the medical record. So you can see how uh, things change. I and mean, you can see you can be in a big building and talk to people briefly about the referral and not necessarily go and find the next terminal to enter the information. So it's an interesting um, 
new development. So, how do we start doing poor performance to medical records? So, um, <coughs> in the mid 90s, after mid about 10 years was the peak of that, between mid 90s and about 2013, 14, about there, um, then we use access, access to this assessment tool. And um, they, there were two streams working in parallel. So you had organizations like the London Deanery, and I used to work there, that's why I gave my interest. Uh, I was um, heading for a few years the Poor Performance Unit in London. Uh, so we were doing all that work, but our aim was uh, to um, uh, learn from the medical records as to what was wrong with the, with the doctor's practice, having accepted all the previous uh, truths that the medical records do represent your practice is not just one aspect, but they can be a, a demonstration of a systemic uh, way of practicing and you can see whether somebody's going badly or wrongly. So we used to look at medical records and try from there to support and advise GPs. Sometimes the GPs had been referred to us by the GMC, for example. And uh, we used to run a course called the Fresh Start course uh, where uh, at some point I introduced a module uh, with help of some other colleagues, a module specifically about medical records. So we made up some medical records, yeah. those old ones. We wrote them down, uh, quite large numbers, because you can't just say three or four, I think we did 13 or 50. And then we used to um, ask the other GPs that came to the course to look at the medical records and tell us what the thing was missing or was wrong. And then give them or um, give them the scenarios and ask them to make medical records from those and then we will assess them. So there was that developmental work, but at the same time there was a National Clinical Assessment Service, NCAS, which doesn't uh, exist anymore in this form, they've been subsumed into other organizations, mostly into the GMC uh, assessment area, and they would actually uh, assess individual GPs and often they would use medical records as one of the assessment tools. They would also do um, kind of simulated surgeries, uh, which Fresh Start was doing as well as an assessment tool, where people would do very much what we do here in simulated surgery, but they would try to see where the GP was compared to his peers. And it was all very dependent on having sufficient data from a larger <coughs> cohort of the peers so that you can actually assess them. The Care Quality Commission is in, uh, a new beast, and I'll say a few things about it uh, later. They do now look at records, electronic records, when they come in. Um, so the Care Quality Commission, when they come in, um, they will do an assessment of the entire practice. They normally have a GP with them, and you will sit with another GP in the consultancy room in front of your terminal, and they say, let's do some consultations. And from there, you will jump into templates, why the alerts are there, and then you go and do your prescribing, and of course, the computer, you can't hide anything. So, see your diazepam and say, oh, let's look at the previous history of diazepam. So, oh, you prescribe 200% of the recommended. So, all these things that were not available in paper are just suddenly there if you look at the screen in real time with your, with your person you're assessing. So, but they're a new uh, animal. General medical council always did, uh, and they have assessors that look at records. Now, primary care trusts have had a very ambi uh, ambivalent stance towards these assessments. Sometimes they saw it as a, as a formative developmental tool, and other times saw it as something to, a way to get rid of GP that was a thorn on the side. Um, and sometimes they would ask the GP tutor to get involved and, uh, and act on that. And it really depended on the primary care trust and the medical director. But what I'm going to show you next is, what I'm talking about is the systematic review of medical records, which is different from looking at the medical records of a particular GP, sorry, sorry again, looking at the medical records of a particular patient and the entries for that particular patient record from one or many GPs. What I'm talking about is going there um, in a pre-organized routine fashion in call without a complaint or that specific complaint into a practice and get a random selection of records, um, 100 records, 200 records, and going through them, trying to see 
how the GP reports things, files things, and then from that also look at the systems they have, how do, do they get notified about for results, and uh, what would, how do they act, how do they mark that they've seen, and so on. So this is what, this is what uh, I'm talking about here, more than you have a complaint, you go to the GMC, they get a medical advisor, <coughs> and he looks at your records, he looks at your particular complaint. So uh, this was like uh, a bit like a, a TV program where they look at all cases of murders, what's mm -hmm. it called, uh, from the grave or something, or something like that. Um, so uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, you could have a single-handed GP with 2,000 patients and 100 of his medical records randomly selected and examined. Uh, sometimes you can then widen that if you think there are worrying signs. Um, and uh, I was once involved with a team of reviewers. Uh, there was a practice with 5,000 records and with as many as 3,000 before the health authority decided that they had enough information and they would stop it. So literally, you pull out records and each day you look 15, 20, 30 records. It's very tiring work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very unsettling for the practitioner who is examined like that because you feel that people are always going to find something wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it's not a good feeling to be under the microscope. But that's what we used to do. Um, and um, in, uh, in 2006, we actually published some work um, under the title Local Performance Investigation in Primary Care, and uh, specifically about the training and development of a group of lay and professional investigators to do these investigations. And uh, I worked the time with uh, uh, Professor McAvoy and other people who came together from the GMC, uh, uh, the NCAS, and so on, to work in, in this area. Um, and the idea was because the work was growing and PCTs wanted to do this work more and more, it was very much in fashion, that you need numbers. If you're going to be reviewing this kind of numbers of records, you need numbers of assessors to do it. And we started with professional investigators, but you can't find enough GPs to do that. You can't really pay them well enough to come and do it for hours. Um, so we started looking at lay assessors and, and lay investigators and whether that would work. And, and in fact, um, we devised a training program, which was all again about um, creating medical records and putting their little patterns and traps that we, we will make up and then get these people trained. And they were just as good at uh, picking up things that were wrong. And in fact, there was quite a good correlation about um, finding problems with the medical records and the GP being indeed poorly performing or the practice poorly performing, but also there was no real difference uh, between the GP investigators and the lay investigators as to whether, or not a statistical difference we could see, uh, as to whether they were uh, more relevant or more likely to pick up errors. There were endless exercises of calibration in a lot of the way days um, and so on, but it was all good fun. Um, and actually presented that uh, uh, investigation in 2006 in Wonka. Um, so that was all to do about systematic reviews of, of medical records. But these reviews became, became gradually less common uh, and there's a lot of less expertise of the people that were doing those because of course uh, if you don't do it you become a bit rusty. Um, there were many reasons for that. One is that the uh, various organizations were driving it, uh, change or disappeared, the PCTs became CCGs. Um, and, uh, we never got properly evaluated local investigations, you know, whether they're successful in remediating uh, whether performance difficulties or whether used as a as a stick to beat somebody. Um, and of course, the medical record changed. Like I said earlier, the medical record you can't just go in and do this paper thing. You just the ground shifted from under our feet. You know, it just became more electronic and more and more electronic. However. That early work and the work before that in the importance of medical record, which I haven't really gone on too much about, all the continuity and so on, um, has new applications now. And one of them is the development of electronic medical records. Because although I talked about technology and how amazing it is, whether it's good or bad, it is still based on the 
the, the, the physician uh, aid tools are really based on those initial principles that I mentioned earlier, the principles of the GMC, the principles of the, of the medical defense organizations, and those principles are not their principles, it's, it's experience has been distilled from, from work that's been done over the years. So, for example, um, templates. Just to say, do you understand what a template is? So, you sit on your screen, and instead of putting, I'll just say for those who may not, instead of putting information in free text, or just by randomly collecting bits, you have prearranged a set of uh, evaluations, observation, investigation to come together in a little package. Let's say if you do a pediatric examination. So you have there, it all appears together, the chest examination, the ENT examination, the fontanelle, the, the pulse, the whatever. And then just as you do them, you can click along and, and, and get them. Uh, and then it all records it, beautifully spelled, in the medical records. Now, one of the very big developments that happened over the last uh, two or three years is that those templates have become more sophisticated in recording the negative findings. That was one of the big problems of the early templates. So you click there if there was, uh, I don't know, a sunken fontanelle, but there was nowhere to click if the fontanelle was normal, just to pick an example of pediatrics. Mm -hmm. So when your record was completed, you hadn't recorded that the fontanelle was normal, although you could in your defense say, well, that was my template, and if it had been abnormal, I would have picked it. Mm -hmm. Same with the chest, the chest examination, you could have put crepitations, you know, we put, uh, I don't know, wheezing and so on, but there was no value entered for a normal uh, investigation. So this was all from a recognition that from these earlier principles that the negatives, the relevant negatives, also need to be recorded. Um, GPs used to always write no red flags. Mm. Well, that doesn't wash anywhere anymore. You know, what do you mean by no red flags? Back pain, no red flags. Well, you actually have to say, I don't know, no paresthesia, no loss of power, no this, no that. So that is one of the uh, applications that um, it helps a lot with all this add-on software to actually correlate with the principles of the good medical practice when you keep records, plus the fact that you, you have the, the contemporaneous and the difficult to tamper with and the got date stamps and so on. But the other part is developing uh, education and training tools, particularly with general practitioners. General practitioners have jumped into this uh, a lot quicker and a lot more enthusiastically than our hospital colleagues. So, um, we're going to go backwards and forwards now, Vic. Okay? So I told you earlier to pay a lot of attention on the principles of good record keeping from the MPS. Um, and we're going to compare those now with domains that we assess for a case based discussion. Now, this is not a dementia assessment, so I will not ask you to remember what there were mm -hmm. 20 slices earlier. I'm just going to show you again. So, what makes good clinical records? Content. So, um, I did point a few things here, the all about examination, history, uh, all systems examined, okay, uh, the second view of the content, um, uh, treatments, uh, referrals, working with colleagues and so on. So this is uh, CBD domains, these are domains we do here, we do them in RCGP in the UK. I've uh, underlined some because it's very immediately obvious that the, the data gather interpretation. So this is the same thing as you look at your findings, your results, and you record your interpretation of the records. You know, you say hemoglobin low, therefore anemia, therefore I'm going to do this, rather than just see those early records, vomited twice, died. <laughs> <laughs> don't know what happened in between, or, or you know, weekly value. <laughs> don't know anything else about that. Um, and the same with the clinical management, managing complexities, these are all uh, areas that uh, are part of the good medical practice. And to just persuade you a bit more, I actually superimposed. So there you are. There you are, examination of data gathering interpretation. Uh, again, data gathering interpretation, making diagnosis and decisions. This is completely straight out of the CBD domains. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, investigations, everything is based or has a correlation 
with a good clinical record. Because we think that the clinical record is not just a clinical record, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a mirror of the practice. So, um, working with colleagues, uh, information with patients, patient, so those two are about, about the ethical approach, consent and so on. Uh, this is about fitness to practice, uh, making sure you record the drugs and, and uh, the contents and versus. There was, um, there was big news in the UK. The UK sometimes doesn't have many news because it's all about Brexit. Mm -hmm. So the big news, just four or five days ago, all the newspapers picked it up. Some uh, body, I don't know, the, some sort of health body declared that um, uh, at least that many thousand prescription mistakes happen uh, every year in the UK. Do, do you remember you read it? Mm -hmm. And they extrapolated that there's a certain number of deaths, avoidable deaths, just because of that. So the ministers were rolled out, and going to make the GP stop having handwritten prescriptions. It's going to be this, going to be that. I can't remember who's the who's the research from. Which, what institute do you hear from? Uh, there, there are two universities in the which ones. Yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, this is all about fitness to practice. This is uh, from the ePortfolio. This is a main training tool for GP trainees in the UK. And uh, when I do the, my educational supervisor report, these are the competences that um, we have to do. We have to write a lot of rubbish or useful things under each heading. Um, and I could just say here, as I think our current Prime Minister said once in Parliament, remind you of something? So, um, yeah, it's exactly what it is in, in all the other domains, the CBDs, uh, and the good medical practice regarding medic keeping medical records. So, um, you can see this new area of development of uh, medical records. Not only they have become what could be recorded and what should be recorded has become the, uh, the driving force in developing policies and developing tools, but going around again, the actual tools we develop, the educational tools, then match up with what are the good principles. And it's always logical that we do that. So I think that will be the next big area um, of uh, work that should be done on medical records, but it should be done in a completely different way because it's now all electronic. So I think, and we already know this, when, I, when we sit down with our trainees to do case-based discussions, it's impossible these days to do them unless you sit in front of the computer and you look in the clinical system and you look at the consultation entries and what happened. They don't have to put all that in paper. So that is where we're all going to be going. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of good research to take place there. I'm not sure we're the one doing it. <laughs> so, but maybe it will be. Um, so, So that's it, basically, which was said earlier. One has reached a conclusion, it was said in 1954. Mm -hmm. one, one can say that. So that is, thank you very much. Thank you very much.